Hello and welcome to Sat TV Week, the news program for the international satellite industry. In this week's program, Trisha Jones looks at the latest launch developments, Richard Hooper talks to Martin Coleman of the Satellite Interference Reduction Group, and Carrie Ann has the latest news. But first, UTELSAT categorically refutes recent reports that claim it is generating interference to its own satellites in order to prevent reception of, in Iran of international FASI satellite channels. These allegations are in total contradiction with reality. Over more than two years, UTELSAT has publicly condemned intentional jamming of its satellites by third parties organised to prevent reception of international FASI channels including BBC Persian, Voice of America and Deutsche Welle. UTELSAT maintains a constant dialogue with international FASI channels and service providers affected by deliberate jamming. Michael DeRozan, UTELSAT CEO, told SATTV that in our capacity as a satellite operator, we remain committed to defeating this abuse. We call on those of influence to do all they can to impress upon Iran the illegal nature of intentional jamming and the need to cease this activity immediately. Now, here is Carrie Ann with the news headlines. According to Christine Ben Amram, Marcon manager at RRSAT Global Communications Network, the company has capacity available on its Intelsat 10 C band MCPC platform and on its Hotbird 6 MCPC platform right now. The Intelsat 10 at 68.5 degrees east has a premier video distribution and contribution community linking Asia, Africa and Europe with 160 plus video channels and reaching an estimate of 120 plus million pay TV subscribers in Asia. With a constellation of three high power satellites, the Hotbird family at 13 degrees east is one of the largest broadcasting systems in Europe, delivering 1,100 television channels to more than 120 million TV homes in Europe, North Africa and the Middle East. The company can capture client content from anywhere and uplink it to Intelsat 10 Hotbird, as well as over 40 MCPC satellite platforms. SES has signed a capacity and uplink agreement with M7 Group, the Luxembourg-based satellite television provider, for distribution via Astra's 19.2 degrees east orbital position. The newly contracted capacity on 19.2 degrees east will be used for the direct-to-home distribution of French-speaking channels for the Belgian market. <music> The SIRG annual conference was held in Sandbanks, Dorset, in October, and Richard caught up with Martin Coleman and asked him about satellite interference and the industry's response. Now, Martin, we've heard a few pointers come out of the satellite conference this morning, <laughs> uh, something to do with the VSAT sector and also oh, yes. the military sector. Oh, yes. Can you elaborate a bit more? Yeah, I think, first of all, on the military side, uh, we've probably this year taken IRG out of its comfort zone. We've, we've pushed it around the planet a little more, I think. I think that's well known. But one area we've not engaged with or finding difficult to engage, and that's very apparent from our conference, is, is engaging with the military. They have the same problems too, just looking at the commercial military uh, systems. Um, but we get a lot of pushback or nobody wants to talk. Uh, I think they do, and SATCON this year in New York, we, we found that it, it is there, people do want to talk. It's just they're taking their time and looking at what the commercial guys are getting up to to see if it helps actually resolve their situation. The trouble is we need them too because they have to resolve their own situation, training, you know, certification of trainers, and, and they have to get involved in the same processes. But of course we've heard a lot of mention of Iraq today. Yes. Um, but surely in an active war zone, the military aren't going to care, care about interfering with commercial satellites. Exactly, and here you go. I mean, if it's not a, a direct problem with a country, which also involves politics, ITU, which all of that has no teeth. So we have no chance, and the military aren't going to just stop whatever strange systems they have operating on the ground because they, they can't stop them. But I think if we engage to, to, to point out what the effects were and what it was doing to not only their own services but you know commercial services, you know, it's a global issue. 
I think we could get somewhere. We don't need to know anything. We just need to get people aware so that someone can talk to someone else and fix it or sort out perhaps why. Maybe some of their technology needs a little bit of cleaning up. Maybe it's as simple as that. Yeah, just turning our attention towards the VSAT sector. You know, it's, you know, it's a bit oh, of a yes. heated discussion oh, about yes, the VSAT yes. sector. Now, surely this is a sector that you can correct and you can get them to work together. But from what I'm hearing, it's still an issue. It's, it's in heavy debate. Um, We've, as you know, with the new technologies, we're, we're fairly sure where we're going with the SCPC type of systems, data, video, etc. That's We're okay there. <clears throat> but on the VSAT side, it all seems a little too perfect. The systems are so big, the operators, the people, the companies that supply are big. We have a working group, but we're struggling to give answers to them. They need facts and figures to prove a point. Um, we're struggling to get them engaged, what I think properly, but we had a little bit of a, it's been difficult, we've had another difficult round, but I think we've just broken it again, and this group's determined and took on action points itself, and we're starting with the operators, let's feed the facts to these guys, if they need facts then we've got to give them the facts, let's not argue, let's look at it and debate this properly. But I'm hoping, there's a genuine hope here, that they can speed up, start looking at technologies or even what they may have already. It may be all solved. We're just not working that patch. We may have a perfectly good solution that will get us through the next five years. So please engage VSAT guys. You know, this is all we ask. You know, I, I can take the rap, but you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be on your case because I believe TDMA burst mode systems. They have to be ID'd and they have to come into the process we're trying to do. Well, the gentleman from SES mentioned about type approvals, mm. but not every VSAT system is type approved. Is that something that... Exactly. And, and again, we're back into the type approvals. It's, it used to happen. It was very successful, but it cost money, big money. And there we have it, because service costs for VSATs in particular have to be cheap. And so we have this massive problem. How do we get mass-produced units installed correctly and working properly? It, but it's down to the training and type approval type of processes. And type approval, I don't think, is going to come back in the same form. Yes, it would be very formal for large stations, but where VSATs, it's got to be working with the manufacturers to make sure systems can only be put together in a certain way. You can't add different amplifiers on at will. Simple things that might be by simple connectorization might just make it a difference. So we may not be able to fix everything that's there now, and that's hence the ID is the solution to that, but we can start to look at how we get whatever we call type approval, how we get the quality yeah. and the precision back into the system. And I think that's what we're coming now, for. Now, you've got a good turnout and you've got the key operators here. Yes. How nice is it to see them all working together to try and Well, this has been a difficult year for us as a new group. We've reformed and restructured and moved ourselves around the planet. Um, and we were a little scared and nervous at this conference because, you know, we, the sponsorship's down this year because, you know, finances are very tight now for companies. But guess what we're getting out of this conference? People are coming here because they want to work. And that is really good news for us. We want this. This is an engineering group. We support GVF. We support WBUI SOG. You know, we support RFIEUI. It's an engineering group that's trying to solve things at the engineering level that we then feed into the industry yeah. to start solving everything else, and that's our job. And it's very apparent that we've got 50 plus people here wanting to do that, and yeah. thank goodness, I'm really pleased, really pleased. Martin, thanks. No, thank you, Richard, thank you. Now, here is Trisha with the launch news. The launch of the United Launch Alliance's Atlas V rocket carrying NASA's Mars Science Laboratory, which has been delayed by 24 hours, will now take off on Saturday the 26th of November from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. MSL is the last of five critical missions and will assess whether Mars is a habitable environment able to support life. The one hour and 42 minute launch window opens at 10.02 a.m. EST and the journey will take nearly nine months. MSL's prime mission will last approximately two years.
The basic build-up for the Ariane 5 for Ariane Space's upcoming ATV mission has been completed as preparations continue for an early 2012 launch from the spaceport to service the ISS. Once the built-up Ariane 5 has finished the current phase of validation tests in the Spaceport's Launcher Integration Building, it will be moved to the final assembly building and delivered to Ariane Spass for installation of the ATV and the final operations leading the launch. The latest ATV is named after Italian cosmic ray physicist Eduardo Amaldi and will carry cargo, water and propellant to the space station. And finally, Comtech EF Data and Tran and Tran have completed interoperability testing on the Sailor 900 VSAT. Gabby has the full story. Comtech EF Data Corporation and Tran and Tran have successfully completed the interoperability testing of the Sailor 900 VSAT Marine Stabilized Antenna Systems and the Ross Open Antenna Management Protocol. The interoperability will enable the Sailor 900 VSAT antenna systems on maritime vessels to globally roam across multiple satellite beams, maintaining connectivity moving through different satellite footprints and enhancing communication capabilities at sea.